Hi, Bio 195 students. This is Dr. Ruthig, and today I'm going to talk to you about how biologists classify organisms, and then we're going to move on to the mosquito key that you are going to use to identify the mosquitoes for your study. So to begin, uh, we're going to talk about Carl Linnaeus, who developed the system of classification in the 1700s that we still use today. So there's a picture of Carl Linnaeus. He was a, a Swedish biologist and he had sort of a life's mission to classify and organize uh, all the plants and animals that he could get his hands on. So he spent a long time um, making sort of the uh, deciding what a species should be of each organism that he found. And he looked at a wide diversity of organisms. And then he created this classification system uh, where the biggest classification is the kingdom. Within kingdoms, you have phyla. Um, sometimes in plants, you'll see them called divisions. Uh, below phylums, you have classes, then orders, then families, and then genera. And be careful with genera. So a single of the word is genus and plural is genera. Uh, some people will say genuses, but you'll sound like you don't know what you're talking about. So make sure you say genera for if you have more than one genus. And finally, the level of classification that is the smallest is the species. Every now and then you'll see uh, times where biologists will have subspecies for some groups of organisms, but for, for the most part, species is as low of a level of classification that you'll see. So it can be hard to remember all of these words sometimes. And so the one that I learned in uh, high school, uh, it was King Phillips came over for good spaghetti, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. But see if you can come up with your own list in order to, uh, to remember all of these, uh, all of these words. So how can we do this for humans? Let's go through. Uh, hopefully you know what kingdom we're in. We're in the kingdom animalia, we're animals. Um, any ideas what phylum we're in? This is a harder one. We're in the phylum chordata, which includes all of the vertebrates as well as the several other kinds of organisms um, that have a uh, something, uh, uh, some of the characteristics in common. Uh, we're in the course of the class mammalia. So we have hair and we have mammar mammalial gland, mammary glands. Uh, we're in the order primates. We're an ape. Uh, apes and monkeys are in the order primates. We're in the family hominidae. It turns out today we're the only member of the family hominidae. There were some extinct members of our group, but we're the only one left. We're in the genus homo and we're in the species sapiens. A few rules on how to write and type species names. Uh, first of all, when we type a species name, uh, we're always going to use the genus and the species. When we do that, when we're typing that name, you'll see that we capitalize the first letter of the genus. So you can see the H of Homo is capitalized there. And then the species names will be lowercase, so, so Homo sapiens. You can also see that, that those two words are all italicized. So Homo sapiens should be italicized. And anytime you write the name of a species down, you should italicize it. If you are writing it, uh, it's hard to write in italics. And so what you do is you underline the word. So if you're writing Homo sapiens, you should underline it. Okay, so Carl Linnaeus came up with this level of classification of, of King Philip came over for good spaghetti. Um, but when we start looking at the diversity of life, it became clear that we need a higher level of, of organization. And so the person who did that used a, a strategy that was a little different than Carl Linnaeus. So Carl Linnaeus would look at organisms and decide that organisms that look like each other belonged in the same classification. Modern day evolutionary biologists use a tool called phylogenetic trees where we usually at the DNA of organisms and we determine that uh, organisms that have similar DNA are more likely closely related to each other. And usually using uh, computer algorithms, we make trees out of that. One of the most famous trees ever made was done just down the road at the University of Illinois by Carl Bose. And what he did is he looked at ribosomal DNA, the kind of DNA that all living organisms have. He sequenced that DNA for a huge range of different kinds of species, including bacteria. At the time, this uh, another group of bacteria called the archaebacteria. Uh, they, that's the name under the name archaea on this, and you'll see why in just a sec. And also eukarya. And so eukarya are all organisms that have nuclei and, and large organelles. And so what he found was, was pretty striking. 
Uh, I mentioned be before that archaea were considered the sort of subgroup of bacteria. And what you can see on this tree is that archaea are in fact more closely related to us, to the eukarya. So if we look at the diversity of life, what we see is there are two groups, uh, the bacteria and the archaea, that are single-celled, black nuclei, very, very small, uh, and look a lot like each other, frankly. Um, uh, lots of bacteria and archaea, if you looked at them under a microscope, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between them. But what was really striking about Carl Wozo's tree was that we find that the archaea are actually more closely related to us, the eukarya, than they are the bacteria. So bacteria are by themselves, and archaea are on a branch with, with us. Uh, the other thing I want you to notice is that how much diversity of all life is taken up by bacteria and archaea uh, and all of the eukarya. So everything from yeast to people to trees to fungi um, to, to fruit flies all are on one branch, whereas bacteria and archaea uh, have their own branches. So we divide up now the world in three domains. And so domain is a la layer that um, uh, Carl Linnaeus didn't use, but it's a level of organization above the kingdom level. Um, and we have three domains, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukarya. Bacteria and archaea, even though they're not necessarily closely related to each other, are both called prokaryotes because these are organisms that lack nuclei. And then the eukarya is the organisms that have, have a nucleus. But those three big domains are pretty separate from one another. And again, that is the level of organization above a kingdom. So now that we know how life is organized, I'm going to walk through how to use a key uh, in order to be able to identify the genera of mosquitoes that you have in your samples. And so keys are used by field biologists all of the time. Uh, in order to identify uh, different types of organisms. And so keys are usually written by experts in the field, and they're basically a guide to help non-experts or people who may know a lot about a group of organisms but might not be sure exactly what they're looking at to be able to determine which species they have in front of them. And so how they work is they're a set of, of choices, a little like a choose-your-own-adventure, uh, that will lead a a researcher down a path in order so that they can identify what they have in front of them. So why do we need to do this for our project? Well, it turns out that not all mosquito species carry West Nile virus. And so this is a, a link from the CDC. Uh, you should have a, a link to this on the um, on your uh, 195 website. Uh, and you can see there's, there's only a handful of mosquito genera that are known West Nile virus carriers. So what that means is if you just uh, look, tested all of your mosquitoes in your traps for West Nile virus, some of them might not even be worth your time because they don't carry West Nile virus. And so this is an important step in your research project. Uh, many of you also probably have asked questions where you want to test one species at a time. And sort of in order to be able to do that, you need to be able to know what you have in front of you. Okay, so a little bit of the classification. We just learned how to classify organisms. Here's how mosquitoes are identified. Of course, they're in the kingdom Animalia. They're in a different phylum than we are. They're in the phylum Arthrop Arthropoda, uh, and that includes a lot of things with hard exoskeletons. They're in the class Insecta. They're in the order Diptera, and what that means is they have two wings. Most insects have four wings or, or two sets of wings, uh, but uh, mosquitoes and other flies only have two wings. Their, their second set of wings have gotten modified to little things called halters, but they don't look like wings. Uh, and then they're going to be in the family Culicidae. Um, unlike other kinds of flies, uh, mosquitoes have scales on their wings. And we're actually going to use the scales as one of the identification tools as we go through the key. So overall, I won't spend too much time on these slides, but overall, here's what, what you'll be looking at on a mosquito. Uh, number one, uh, there are three big body segments, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. You'll be looking at all three of these throughout the key. Uh, we'll also be using the legs and the wings in order to determine different genera from each other. On the head, we will be looking at different uh, mouth parts. And so you can see the fuzzy antenna. And then uh, many mosquitoes will have a large proboscis, sometimes called a proboscis. Uh, and that's essentially the drinking straw of the mosquito that they'll use to uh, suck the blood out of their host. Okay. 
So as you go through keys, you tend to have two choices. And so it's going to be a series of steps um, where you'll take a look at your organism, you'll look at the descriptions on your two choices, and you'll decide which of those two choices fits your organism best. And so we deliberately started with some easy things uh, to be able to determine, so to get you the hang of using keys. And so sometimes we catch other creatures other than mosquitoes in our, in our jars, and our traps. And so what we're going to do is, is use those in order to get through the first couple steps so that you get the hang of using a key. And so two of the things that we might find um, are things that have three segments. And so you can see on the organism on the left, there's a, there's a clear head, a thorax, and an abdomen. Uh, and if you get that, you can see there's a little number two on the bottom left. That means you're going to go to step two of your key. On the right, you can see that this organism has only two distinct seg segments, something called a cephalothorax, or, and uh, a cephalo abdomen and a thorax, uh, so two parts. Uh, and when you have one of those, it's going to be a spider. Uh, now, there are lots of kinds of spiders, but for the purposes of our study, we're not interested in the different kinds of spiders that we might have caught. And so if you see just a name like spider, you know that you found, and then you, that's as far as you need to go in the key. However, most of the time, you're going to have some more work to do. And so let's what, take a look at what step two looks like. Okay, so on the bottom here is step two. Uh, and so now you have an, have an insect and we can compare those insects. And, and some of the insects that we look at will have four wings and some of them will have only two. If they have four wings, like the organism on the right, it's not a fly and we're not interested in it. And so again, it's an insect, but it's not a dipteran, so there's no way it'll be a mosquito. And so again, you're finished. That's good news if you're, you're done with your work on that insect, but of course it's not going to be a West Nile virus carrier, so you probably means you need to go to your next uh, individual. Uh, but if it does have two wings, that means you're in the right order, which is good news, and so you'll go on to step three. When you're on step three, uh, you'll have some more choices to make. And so uh, the two choices now we have is, our, is it a skinny little fly or is it a big fat fly? And so if it's a little skinny fly, and we've got and right in the name there, mosquito-like body, that probably means that's the way you want to go. So you'll go on to step four. Um, but if you get a big fat housefly looking thing, again, you know that it's not something we look for. You're done with that or organism, but of course it's not going to be a West Nile virus carrier. The next step, this is where it starts to get to be important and where I've seen students make mistakes. So uh, what you're going to look for is that proboscis. And so things that are mosquitoes are going to have a long, discrete proboscis, a big sucking mouth part. Uh, and if it has that, then you've got a mosquito. And so then you're, you're, now you're getting into things that are potential carriers. You will, and we do find in our traps, organisms that don't have long sucking mouth parts, those are midge flies. There are several species of midge flies. They have most of the same anatomy as, uh, as uh, mosquitoes. And so I've seen students go throughout the key thinking they have a mosquito, but then when we get down and we look at the mouth parts after they've done all that work, we see that they're not even looking at a mosquito at all. So they wasted their time. So do take a second to make sure that you've got a long suck, sucking mouth part on your, on your um, fly, because uh, otherwise you'll be wasting your time after this. Another way that you can use the proboscis to tell you something very important is whether or not you have a male or a female. So on the left, you can see the, there is a, a couple palpi. They're pretty long on this one. We'll talk about the importance of how long they are uh, and also a long straight proboscis. And so those are those three sort of long things on the bottom there. And so that's a female mosquito. On the right, you can see that the, um, the palpi are bent, so they have a little angle to them. And one of the easiest things to look at is also the antenna on that mosquito are, are uh, fluffy. In that case, you have a male. We don't catch males often on our traps because the traps are designed to, uh, to attract females. But every now and then we do get a male. And again, a male will never bite and a male will never carry West Nile virus. And so if you do happen to catch a male, uh, you'll need to throw that one out because uh, it's not going to be a West Nile carrier. I mentioned that relative length of the palpi and the um, uh, proboscis there. Most of the mosquitoes that you're going to see will look like the one on the left there. And so that's got a long proboscis, uh, that long straight thing on the bottom uh, out coming out from its mouth, and then a short palpa uh, on the side of it. So those palpi are those little uh, uh, lobes uh, just to the side of that. Uh, most mosquitoes you'll see. Uh, however, we do often catch a genus called uh, Anopheles. And in that species, the palpi are as long as the proboscis. And so if it's 
really long, but they don't have hairy antennas. That means you have a female, but it's in the genus Anopheles. Anopheles can carry West Nile virus. Um, so if you're interested in that genus, um, you may want to keep going in the key. Uh, just be aware that, uh, and actually it's kind of a nice outcome because you know, uh, you'll know what you have at this point. The abdomen is another great character uh, that we'll use in several steps along the key. Um, and we're going to be looking at a few things. One of the early steps is you're going to look to see if the uh, bottom of the abdomen is rounded. You can see the rounded abdomen on the left. Uh, and sometimes the last segment of the abdomen is pointed. And so that's the one you can see. And that one actually has a couple of uh, on the bottom there, uh, some little points there. And so be, that'll be one of the characters you look at. I find it a pretty easy character to see. Another character that you'll be looking at in several steps, and I'll show you some pictures in just a second, uh, is the tarsus. And so there are many leg segments on the mosquito. Um, and at the bottom there, you can see segments labeled one, two, three, four, and five. That segment two, which is a pretty long segment of the leg, is known as the tarsus. And you're going to see several steps where you're going to look at banding or colors or things like that on the tarsus. So be on the lookout for that. Again, you might need to count segments of the leg, uh, but with a dissecting microscope, it's not too hard to find. For example, here are a couple pictures of the types of mosquitoes you'll see, and these are the tarsi of those mosquitoes. You can see the one on the left, it's banded. So there's dark parts and then there are yellowy parts. Other parts, the other mosquito species, the legs will be completely dark. Uh, so with, again, with a light microscope, this is a character that I find to be pretty straightforward to see. Another character that's worth noting and, and you may use in several of your steps is something called the scutum. And so the middle part of the mosquito there is called the thorax and what covers the bulk of the thorax it looks a little like a helmet over the thorax uh, is called the scutum uh, if you this were a, uh, a crayfish or a lobster this is the scutum it usually is what you hold on to uh, but on a mosquito again it has sort of a helmet like uh, protection over the top uh, and there are several characteristics that you might look for some of them have spots some of them have bands some are light colored some are dark colored and so be at the lookout for that character uh, when you're going through your key there is one part of the key where you'll use the eyes. I found this to be a little bit challenging to go through, but if you zoom in nicely on the dissecting scope, you can see this. Uh, some mosquito species will have sort of a white band around the eyes, and so there's some lighter colored scales. So again, you'll need to manipulate mosquito just to get it just right to be able to see that. Uh, but again, uh, be on the lookout for that white band around it, only if your key takes you to that trait. I wanna zoom in here a little bit on the banding of the mosquito. There are several kinds, if actually several different steps within the key where you might run into where banding is important. And so sometimes uh, the top of, this, of a part of an abdomen, so you can see the abdomen is, is sort of segmented there. Uh, sometimes the top part will be light and the bottom will be dark. On that mosquito on the left, there's a little light triangles that you'll see on the side of, of the abdomen. And then so uh, again, several, several mosquitoes, uh, keys and several steps along the key will use the abdomen and the banding and the shapes of the banding uh, in order to determine which is the next step you need to go to. Finally, the last character that you might need to look at, depending on how you follow through your key, uh, is the wing. Uh, the hairs of the wing and the, and the structure of the wings and the veins of the wings are excellent characters to tell different mosquitoes apart. Uh, the key that we use, sort of thankfully, I think students are going to be glad not to be looking at too many characters on the wings, but there's one trait on the wing that you might need to see. You'll need to zoom in. You may need to break off the wing of your mosquito. That is allowed. Uh, you might do it out of frustration at this point, uh, but if you have to break off the wing, that is okay. And right at the base of the wing, you can see some setae. They look like little hairs. Uh, so one of the species that we'll look for uh, will have that setae be as one, one of the characters that it'll look for. So that's the end of the characters that you might see. We'll have a printed key ready for you in the lab to go through, uh, but I wanted to show you before you get into that, some of these characters so that you know what you'll be looking for when you get to them. Good luck with all your keying. I'm excited to see what species we find.